This is Sarah Stewart Holland. This is Beth Silvers. You're listening to Pantsu Politics, where we take a different approach to the news. much for joining us today. We are so happy to welcome back New York Times reporter Jessica Gross to talk to us about the impact of technology in schools. Big subject in my household, Sarah, and Mm -hmm. I believe in yours too. Mm -hmm. And she's going to talk about the implications of that tech in schools for our anxious generation of kids as they are frequently described. Yes, that's also a topic where I live. Everywhere I go, the parents are a Twitter about the anxiety and the tech and the phones and the social media. And should we be following new guidelines about that? And then outside of politics, we're just going to try to get to the really pragmatic issues in our households as well and talk about cups. Cups on counters, Beth. Cups everywhere. Cups on all the counters. Cups on counters. Cups on side tables. Cups on the Mm -hmm, floor. mm -hmm. Cups on stair rails. Cups on beds. Cups, cups everywhere. Cups. I feel in the selection of the topic of tech in schools influenced by Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, Sarah, because there is a distinctive critique of Americans in this book (laughs) that we are so (laughs) busy doing, doing, doing Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. chasing progress we too rarely step back to think, is this what we want? What are we doing here? Why are we doing this? And so I think stepping away from headline news to say, hey, every single day at school, are we doing what we want to be doing? Are we chasing goals that are important to us? What are the values behind this is important. So that is just my today advertisement for the impact that Alexis de Tocqueville is having on me. Because we are doing a slow read of this classic throughout the year, and we would love for you to join us today on our premium channels. You can hear our reflections on the next section, where he does spend a lot of time saying, Americans, you need to slow all the way down, which is not a surprising critique coming from a Frenchman. I'm just going to be honest with you. And it doesn't make me feel cynical or depressed that some of this stuff still rings true. It makes me feel better. Okay, so this is something in our way of being It's something we're always going to have to work at and pay attention to. And reading someone pointing it out during the 19th century makes me feel like, okay, so people have been thinking about this problem, and it's gotten better, and it's gotten worse, and there are sort of waves of attention or inattention to these issues inside sort of the, the American psyche. And so many people before me have thought about it, so I have to start from scratch. And that makes me feel better. I absolutely agree, and it underscores for me the reason we wanted to take this project on. In a time of anxiety, we get emails every week saying, I am so worried. In a time of anxiety, it's very grounding. It's such a relief to read this book and realize we have some new new twists on old classic problems. Yes. And yes. thinking through how to describe those problems and what they connect to and how they've been handled before is just profoundly helpful. Agreed. So you can get that discussion that we just had on the latest section through Patreon or Apple Podcast subscription. And all the information on how to do that is in our show notes. We also have a very fun update from the other book club. We're just, you know, readers here. We're book club people. So We're homework people. So our other book club that we recently talked to you about, where we have two summer fiction selections chosen by listeners, sold through Lisa at the bookshelf on Church in Irvington, Virginia. We have sold out of those book club boxes. And that is awesome and fun. It is also huge for the bookshelf on Church in Irvington, Virginia, (laughs) because our book club is going to enable Lisa to pay rent at her new brick-and-mortar location for six months. Our community just helped launch a brick-and-mortar version of a bookshop in a place that Lisa has told us is a book desert. And it really fills me with a lot of joy and gratitude. Sorry, it took me a minute because I'm a librarian's child and I love books and I love bookshops. And just hearing that from her really... Warms my heart, hearing her enthusiasm, knowing that this is going to 
just relieve the stress of like, I have to believe one of the hardest periods of launching a small business, those first six months when you have expenses and everybody doesn't know about you yet and you're just trying to build everything up. And I just know how much this community loves to do things like that, like to help a women run small bookshop launch. Come on. And you get an awesome book box along with it. Like, come on. This is a win-win on every single level. And she's working on lots of exciting things so people can order more books from her. Hopefully by our next book box, we're going to have the option that you can add on a book for a prisoner in a local prison by her so that we can push books into other places that are book desert. So it's just, it's incredible. It's incredible. Well done, everybody. Well done. So thank you for being part in so many ways of putting good things into the river. Mm -hmm. And we're excited for you to be here today for this conversation with Jessica Gross. We're so happy to welcome back Jessica Gross, New York Times opinion writer to Pantsuit Politics. Jessica, you write a twice weekly email newsletter that is one of my favorites because I feel like whatever I've just had a conversation with a friend about that we're kind of frustrated about or trying to work through, your column appears and it happens to be on the subject that we are working through. It is wild. Or like you're like psychic or something. So you're very plugged into my stage of life, at least. I love to hear that. Thank you. It's so true. So Jessica, let me share a story with you, if I may, to kick off this conversation. About once a month, once every two months, I get a call from my 12-year-old son's middle school. And they call me and they say, Miss Holland, Amos is not paying attention in class. Mm-hmm. Amos is on games on the internet. And we tell him not to. And then he just gets right back on the computer. And it's really distracting. And do you know what I say to them, Jessica? I say, you gave him the computer. Mm-hmm. You gave him the piece of addictive technology. And so I do not feel responsible for this. I can't stay off my own cell phone. Mm -hmm. I don't have a lot of good ideas for how to keep Amos off his. In my home, his internet usage is completely restricted. His screen time is very limited. So if you would like to take the computer away from him, feel free. You have my full and complete permission. I don't want him on it at school at all. And sometimes they go, great. The math teacher is like, oh, would you like him to have his physical textbook back? And I said, dear Jesus, yes, I would like that. Please do that. But I feel like it's so frustrating when I get those calls because I just want to say, I didn't, I don't want this. I don't want this. So I feel no obligation to fix it for you because I don't Mm -hmm. think a fix is available if I'm being very honest. I feel you on so much of this. I personally just deleted TikTok and threads from my phone yesterday (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) because these technologies are meant to be addictive. They are for all of us and they do a very good job. And I think my overall sort of thesis on tech in the classroom, so I wanted to learn about from teachers and parents granular detail about how tech was being used, because Mm -hmm. there is actually a paucity of research on this, especially up-to-date research. Um, We just don't know exactly how it's being used. There are so many classrooms across the country. Every district has a different policy. Um, So I launched this survey through my column, and a thousand people answered, and I read as many of the responses as I could. And my sort of overall take on it is This has been happening for a long time, but it really went off the rails in 2020 to 2021 when our children had to have screens to get even the bare semblance of an education. And when the kids went back to in-person school, whenever that happened for them, tech was not always reintegrated thoughtfully. Mm. So again, it's hard to make generalizations because it's totally different in every school district, in private versus public, in charter versus private. There are many different sort of philosophies and uses, but often the default is just to use a screen. Whereas before, maybe it wasn't. So for example, I've heard from many teachers, I would love to have a physical textbook. Mm -hmm. I prefer that. But the district has decided that all our curriculum is going to be digital only. And so even if I wanted to give a child a textbook, I couldn't. Um, So at least you have that going for you that they still have the math textbooks to give. And so, you know, 
I talk to not just teachers and parents, but lots of experts who have studied this for a long time and also flagged how little research there is. So, you know, I talk to academics at the Harvard Graduate School of Education who did research on apps for kids uh, pre-K through age three. And they told me that when they did a literature review um, and there are hundreds of thousands of apps in app stores that are tagged as educational. There are 36 studies. So considering the amount, the flood of these apps and not even, and those studies weren't always even about things that were on the commercial market. Some of them were on apps that were developed by educators just for the study. And that's apps, like forget YouTube, forget anything else. Like that's just apps. Right. So these are, we don't even know if this tech works or much less if it works better than a de- you know having uh, an analog version so you know after having all of these discussions and really thinking through thinking through the ethical implications i mean that's something i find is really under discussed and i find honestly the most frightening for my own children is their privacy in many public schools you cannot opt out of doing things like google classroom There's just no alternative. Um, And so the kids can't sort of meaningfully consent to their data being used in whatever way it's used. And, you know, those sorts of rules and laws are incredibly opaque. Um, So I find that to be really troubling and something that I don't think that we fully thought through the impact of or thought through what, you know, children deserve and what their rights should be for their own data. So that's like an entirely separate thing. (laughs) Not just, you know, are they learning? Are they distracted? Is this the best method to teach the things that we want them to learn? And so your experience is just very typical. Mm. It's, you know, it's happening everywhere. Yep. I'm having a hard time almost formulating my next question because my brain is also in the 7,000 layers of this that just present in my life. And I know that my life is just one life. (laughs) Um, I think I want to push back against my own brain a little bit and ask Mm -hmm. you, as you sorted through those thousand responses, what did you hear from educators as the advantages for them of using this tech in classrooms? How did we get here? So, I mean, look, there are certainly advantages, and I think that I am somewhat persuaded by the idea that we need to make kids into good digital citizens. Mm -hmm. They are going to use these technologies. They are integrated into all of our lives in deep, deep ways. And so we can't have zero tech, or they're never going to learn how to responsibly use these things and integrate them into their lives and their work lives um, and to develop the skill of of paying attention even when there are these digital distractions. So I think that is sort of a compel, you know, again, that doesn't mean we should let it be used in the somewhat unfettered way that it is being used now, but that this is a skill that they need to learn. So I think that I would, I don't know if that's a benefit, but that's a really compelling reason for, you know, some tech use. Um, For children who have various disabilities, physical and learning disabilities, you know, tech can really be a game changer. Kids with dyslexia or dysgraphia, you know, just being able to communicate better, better to overcome sort of um, differences in the way that they're processing words and numbers. Um, You know, tech can be incredibly useful for that population and really has changed the game into what they are able to learn. And, you know, there's really clever uses of it often. So, you know, I talked at length to an English teacher. He's a high school English teacher in Indiana. And he was saying tech has allowed him to ask his students deeper questions. So he talked about how, you know, he used to just give vocabulary quizzes that were just the words. You had to learn, memorize the words and their definitions. But now he lets the kids have an online dictionary. And the quizzes are about the specific meanings and the nuances of usage, Mm. which is sort of a deeper thing, right? Um, So he still, you know, requires them to understand and learn, you know, through repetition what these words mean. But what he's quizzing them on is sort of a more complicated thing. So in an ideal world, we could use this tech to sort of do rote things. So things like learning your multiplication tables, learning vocabulary, like you don't, yes, I think an app can definitely help. I see it with my daughter who's learning Spanish. She uses Duolingo as a tool. 
Yeah. But it is not replacing the typical classroom experience. So it was always like things that were additive or allowed for like a deeper learning or understanding of a concept. Um, but it was unusual for me to hear stories of total replacement of previous ways of doing things. So I, you know, one example that is coming up a lot now because AI is like just the newest wrinkle of all of this is like, you know, AI tutors. Well, you know, 10 years ago, there was MOOCs, massive open online courses. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. 10, 15 years ago, all the rage, they were going to replace college. You weren't going to need to go to a traditional college anymore because you could self-pace through these online courses and you didn't need human contact or any of that to really learn things. And they have not lived up to their promises at all. Most people don't finish the MOOCs who take them. Like they're the, these traditional ways of imparting knowledge and the sort of human connection that is involved in imparting knowledge, like that's still not replaceable. And it is and it is sort of depressing to me that that wasn't one of the major lessons that we learned from 2020 and 2021, you know? I mean, school is not just about the academics you're learning. The academics are super important. I care a lot. I'm not like a hippie who hates grades. I love grades. <laughs> I want my kids to be graded. <laughs> graded harshly too. Yeah. Like I want them to, you know, really try. But I think that if we came away from that moment in education and all we learned was test scores dropped, like we are lost the plot. We are, we are not learning the really important lessons, which are school is about socialization. School is about learning to work with people that, you know, are not exactly like you and to navigate situations that are not catered to your you every second of the day. And just so many things that our kids are navigating in the in their sort of day to day. And so, you know, that was sort of my, the takeaway of the of the last piece in the series, which is about solutions. It's like all of these solutions need to be kid centered. And they need to be pro-social and they need to be involving educators in the introduction, in the adoption, because too often the mechanism is that the tech companies offer the products to the schools and then the schools figure out how to use them. And that is not how the relationship should be going. It should be the schools evaluate what's happening and then they bring in whatever tech they think is necessary. So, I mean, that's sort of the overall feeling that I have. We're not recording live, but I can feel the teachers in our audience screaming. Yes. Like, I just, (laughs) you know, I, I mean, I don't know how good we are at learning lessons like that in education because there are so many constituencies. You have so many federal legislators, you have state legislators, you have counties, you have superintendents, you have administrators, you have the teachers and you have the parents. And I think like, look, on on paper, of course, it looks good. Tech always looks good on paper. It always Mm -hmm. looks like it's going to change our lives. Like when you were talking about the grades and there's like this really great conversation about grade inflation. And Mm -hmm. I would like to do a study where I bet you could track grade inflation for when we started using tech to let parents track grades. I bet it would line Mm -hmm. up nicely because it sounds great, doesn't it? Like, oh, we're going to put it on an app and you can see how your kid is doing in school. And it's a disaster. Like it's a complete and total disaster. Like my school uses Microsoft Teams. And in theory, like... I guess the kids should be able to see what's missing and we can see the missing assignments. But I go to my child and I say, we have a missing assignment. And they go, well, I turned it in and she hasn't graded it yet. Or we did it in class, but then we changed it. And like, there's always some reason. And it's like impossible to figure out the truth because it's so buried beyond and below like all these tech solutions that we're supposed to fix everything. And it really does feel like a real live experiment. Like I, I told Beth, like, There are not a lot of things in parenting where I felt like, you know, my oldest son is 14, my middle son is 12. And so I always feel like I'm like in a good space where it's like we've just about figured out something's bad. Just in time for me to go, no, we're not going to do it that way and change course. So like my my 14-year-old doesn't have social media, Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But this is the one where I feel like the kids, my kids' ages are just totally in the middle of a social experiment, like where we're just trying to figure it out. The, The analogy I use all the time is about oh gosh, it was closer in time than I probably wanted to think it was, but it was like five years, 10 years before I came to school. It wasn't 10, y'all. It was was later than that. There used to be a student smoking section at my high school. 
Oh, same, same. It like went away as I was in high school. (laughs) And we look back on that. We're like, oh my God, can you believe there's a student smoking section? And I truly believe in five to 10 years, we'll be like, wow, remember when we were given all these middle schoolers and elementary school kids laptops? That was wild. Why did we do that? You know, like, I just think we... We, it, it sounds like it's going to, maybe because the problems in education are so complex when a quote unquote solution comes along, everybody's like, this is it. <laughs> but it's not, I mean, it's almost never it because of all those reasons you said. It's too complex. It's too decentralized. It's got to be individualized. And it sounds like tech should be able to solve all those individual problems. And I think that's the best, the best application, like you said, that sort of individualization to kids with learning disabilities or special mm-hmm. needs or whatever. That's all we want in education is what we say. Like, everything should be individualized. Meet the child by need, all this stuff. But dang, like, it just, it wasn't individualized in its application. It was just rolled out, and then COVID was like a complete accelerant. Uh, so this academic from the University of Colorado Boulder named Alex Molnar, I just really love talking to him because he has been studying this for a long time. He was really no BS. And what he was saying was the proponents of this will always be like, well, the toothpaste is already out of the tube. We can't put it back in. Like tech is here to stay. We have to. And and I just think that that's such a failure of imagination Mm -hmm. and a failure of thoughtful implementation. So again, all of these things are just tools. They're tools. They are, you know, morally in most cases neutral. Although, like I said, with the data collection, I just am kind of really appalled by how a lot of that is is working in so many different ways like forget schools there's so many aspects of our lives where it's just like we're being surveilled don't get me started on this I will sound like I'm wearing a tinfoil hat at some <laughs> <point>. <laughs> but um you know I, I just think most of these things are just tools and we need to figure out when we need to use them and when is the best time to use them and that they shouldn't just be the default or considered superior because they're more expensive. You know, I mean, I think understandably for a long time, this was discussed as an equity issue. And I think I love to see that schools are providing high-speed internet for some of the families in their districts to allow them to have the same advantages that other kids have when they're doing their homework. Because, you know, if my kid has access to Wi-Fi and a laptop to do her sixth grade homework, she is at an advantage in terms of the ease of that work compared to a kid who wouldn't have that. So I think, you know, again, it's always the devils and the details, Right. Um, So I think there just has been too little scrutiny. And I think, you know, I talked to a superintendent of a school in California where the parents were really dismayed at what their kids were watching on YouTube uh, and lobbied to have YouTube taken off the kids' devices. And he said to me, like, this just wasn't top of mind. He was glad that the parents had brought it to his attention because there's so many other things that these superintendents have to deal with day to day. And I, my heart really goes out to them. I don't think that they have bad intentions, but especially coming back from those pandemic years, mental health is such a, is such an issue. Um, you know, learning loss is such a huge issue, all the social and emotional stuff, There was just a big study that came out from Pew Research that showed that American teachers are not happy. And they're not happy because they feel that they are not just responsible for teaching kids. They are also responsible for the kids' mental health, the kids' poverty that is totally unequal in this country. And we cannot expect teachers to fix everything that is wrong in society. Word. And so I feel like this tech use, it's just like one other thing that we're piling on top of, you know, just too high a plate for for teachers, for schools. But again, I don't think that the way to handle it is just status quo. Just like whatever we're doing now, we'll just keep doing it and not think too hard. Thoughtless use of tech. Tech that is not implemented in a rigorous way, in a way that is saying what is best for these learners at the cognitive levels that they are at. I mean, that's the other thing that I found really sort of upsetting is like, they're like iPads for everyone, one-to-one, the whole district. It's like, well, what's going on developmentally for a second grader is not what is going on developmentally for a 10th grader. And that there wasn't always sort of real thought put into what is developmentally appropriate for kids at what ages, right? So again, what I'm saying is, not like 
burn them all, forget, you know, it's that it has to be done thoughtfully to express the needs of the district and the kids within it. So another sort of positive use case that I heard about was from an elementary school teacher in rural Oklahoma. And she was telling me, you know, the parents may be 45 minutes to an hour away from school. Kids are traveling really long distances to get to the school. And she has found that being able to communicate with the parents virtually has really allowed them to feel more connected to this classroom that is physically extremely far away from them and that they don't get to be sort of part of this community on a day-to-day basis. You know, their kids are being put on a bus and they're traveling really far distances. And that made total sense to me. And she also told me, you know, that she has author visits zooming in. Um, Whereas like I live in New York City, we have children's book authors that come to talk to my kids public school all the time. And they love it. It is really engaging for them. Uh, It gets them sort of really excited. They feel like they're like getting, you know, a celebrity, which is like adorable. Um, And so it's, you know, why shouldn't a kid who lives in rural Oklahoma who will never get, or it'll be real unusual for a children's book author to make an appearance. Like those things like that. I'm like, yes, that makes sense. That is additive. You can see the benefits. Um, so those solutions and those needs, they're not going to be the same as for my kids in their Brooklyn classroom. So mm-hmm. it's just being really like every teacher, every school saying, is this necessary? Is this good? Is there a different tool I could use that could have the same or better outcome? So I think it's just asking a lot of really hard questions that that I think, again, when we came back into the schools after COVID, it was just like, There was so much going on. I do not blame the schools. I do not blame the teachers for not always having a handle on this. It's hard. It is not easy. The volume is, for me, a reason why it's difficult to imagine how you put the toothpaste back in the tube. I went to a couple of school board meetings a couple of years ago. And at one of those meetings, a budget was being presented. And one of the school board representatives was asking about software programs in the budget. And you could feel the room get very defensive because Mm -hmm. this was just right as we're coming out of COVID. Everybody's on edge about everything. And he paused and he said, hey, I'm not questioning the use of these programs in your classrooms. What I'm seeing is it looks to me like we have several different schools using the same technology under different contracts. And it looks to me as a district like we're spending a lot more money for these programs than we could be if we had coordinated the use here. Right. So sit that alongside another school board meeting experience where they were talking about the the use of COVID funds to replace chargers for all of the one-to-one technology. And the percentage of that budget that went to chargers blew my mind. It almost made me cry, thinking about all of the things that money can be used for in a school and that it was going to these chargers. And I've, I've talked to myself, like, don't be judgmental about that. You know, kids who don't have a computer at home probably go through a lot of chargers if they're packing this back and forth, you know. But, but the volume of things and money and line items and programs and classrooms and needs, it, it's kind of like, how do we start down the path of that more thoughtful, critical eye versus what we have right now is our new default? First of all, states need to get involved. Like this is a problem with technology use writ, writ large, and we are so behind the times because this has moved so fast and legislation is very slow. But this stuff needs to be evaluated at the state level. It should not be left to individual districts. There should be frameworks that are passed by the state boards of education that say, this is how you need to evaluate tech in your district. This is the, you know, again, I am not a policymaker. I am not, you know, I'm just a reporter, but like not all states have this. Um, Some states used to have it and don't have it anymore. So, I mean, schools cannot be tasked necessarily to do it on their own. However, I did also talk to some folks from Montgomery County School System in Maryland, 
and they are the largest school school system in Maryland. And they told me, you know, they are creating this infrastructure in the district to evaluate everything. And they are they got grant money for a two year role now. You know, it's sort of disheartening that it's just like a two year role and and hopefully it will be extended. But like the entire point of this role is to do exactly the thing that you just said, to be the liaison with vendors and to, you know, go over these contracts to make sure that they are, you know, meeting the district's goals and that they have, you know, she said also that they will not even consider a contract and from curriculum providers unless it is both digital and analog. So they need to provide both digital textbook and... I really want to write that down for my school district. (laughs) Well, it's the article that published today, which is April 24th. I don't know when it's running, but uh, it has, you know, three sets of recommendations for states, for school districts, and for individual teachers. And it needs to happen at all these levels, right? Because you can have all the rules in the classroom, all the rules in the state, but, you know, it really is up to the individual classroom teacher to do what they think is right. And look, my survey is not nationally representative, certainly did not talk to every teacher in the nation, but like the overwhelming sense I got was they all do not want as much tech in their classrooms. because. It's just another thing for them to deal with behaviorally. They don't think it's helping their kids learn better necessarily, at least in large volumes. You know, they might say like for specific activities, having it out is helpful, but just having it out all the time, mm -mm, no, they do not like it. And, you know, a lot of the teachers I spoke to who had lower tech approaches than other teachers within the same building said that the kids would tell them it's a relief to be in your classroom. The screens are exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> like having 45 minutes where I am not on a device and my brain can rest, it's relaxing for me. So the I mean I don't even think the kids want it all the time. We're having this big conversation about the anxious generation and all this anxiety. And it's not just social media and it's not just cell phones. It's having that where you do not have a quiet time for your brain at any point that builds anxiety. At my local high school, they make the kids put their cell phones away. And at first they were like, oh, my God. And then almost to a kid afterwards, they were like, we kind of like this. Oh, you don't say, you know, you don't say that you do like having that taken away from you. And I think like that's what's so hard. We're having this big conversation about the kids individual technology. And so you can see if you're a tech coordinator, you're like, you want me to take their laptops away and they all have cell phones in their pockets? You know what I mean? So, like, you have this. Because, I mean, we have kids at the elementary school level that has a cell phone. Listen, my my youngest son has a cell phone because he's a type 1 diabetic, and that's what sends his CGM Mm -hmm. score to me. Now, I did get smart way for many more months after than I should have, and I just didn't give him the code because I just needed to send the number to me. He does not need to be on it. Right. should have figured that out from the beginning. Heads up to any type 1 day parents. But that's such a good point. Like, there's always reasons. Like, every thing is on these phones now. So it's really hard. You have the phones, you have the laptops. And then I really think this curriculum situation is like the like simmering underbelly of all this too, that like the parents really don't see it. I think as much I've started going to every one of our like local school, it's called site-based decision-making in Kentucky. And they were talking about this new math curriculum and the math curriculum person told them, well, it takes one to two years to really start see the impact of this this tech approach to math curriculum, right? Well, mm-hmm. okay, so what happens in a brain as a human? You invest all this money, you invest two years, and then it doesn't work and you say, what, we're going to lose the two years we just invested. We're going to switch to another one that's going to take another two years to really get like, you see, like it's like this sunk cost, like especially if you used all these COVID funds for it. But also like our kids only get one go through. That's the thing. <laughs> exactly. So the kids that are gone through this year that you're learning to use the curriculum, what happens to them? And it's like yeah. all this COVID funds, like I can see the le- reason of, oh, okay, well, we're going to use this one time. We can't hire teachers with the COVID funds because we got to keep paying the teachers and the COVID funds are going to dry up. And so yeah. on paper, again, the tech makes sense, right? Except for it's never just a one-time fee, ever, even with a laptop. My kids break those screens, they lose them. You have to pay the staff to manage the pickup and the drop off of all. The, it was such a process to get all these new screens to the high schoolers. Like, Like, and you had to have a parent there where every kid can't get a parent there. Like, it's just everything is such a 
Like all this tech, which seems like a solution, is such an investment in the teachers, the administrations. You have to hire more tech people at the school to handle all this tech. Like it's just such a like an albatross. It's a racket. It's a it's racket. A, such a racket. No, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, and it never ends. So now I don't know if you saw the articles. I linked to it in my newsletter last week. Meta is now trying to push VR in schools. Can you imagine how quickly a VR headset is going to get broken? Oh, my God. Five minutes. Classroom? Four to five, five minutes, minutes. Max. So, who, I mean, I am very skeptical of whatever would be the benefit of them in the first place. But just like from a completely logical, practical point of view, these kids are going to break VR headsets faster than you could, you know, <laughs> blink. And so just the practicality. Um, and they're so expensive. I mean, at, at the K through 12 level, I mean, maybe you could make a case for it at the college level. But even then, I got my first like laptop in my educational experience in law school. And it was bad for me. I learned less in law school because I had the laptop that I never had in college. It was Beth is sh- shaking her head. You guys can't see this. but It was not great. We were chatting during class we, and we were 20 year olds. Like it didn't matter. It didn't matter. It was freaking distracting. I mean, the other thing I I think is such a canard and really bothers me about the arguments in favor of it is the workforce readiness argument. So kids do not need to be on screens 24-7 to be ready for the workforce. And, you know, obviously this is anecdotal, but I had lots of friends who ended up pursuing careers in engineering, computer science, all of that. They did most of their learning in their downtime. They were not learning how to do those things in school. They were fooling around in their free time on their computers. And so the idea that you need to have screens in every single subject at every single moment for some vague idea of workforce readiness or that like an 11-year-old needs to be really great at PowerPoint, like they can teach themselves that. It's not hard. Most of these programs are not hard to yes. use, especially the ones used in corporate America. Um, my older daughter, who is now in sixth grade, totally taught herself how to use Google Slides when she was doing remote school. She just taught herself. She was eight. <laughs> like these are not hard programs to use or to master. So the, the idea that like we need to take precious class time where the kids could be learning an infinite amount of other things expanding their minds, learning their critical thinking skills, keeping their attention spans in a healthy range. (laughs) Yes, there's so many other things that they could be learning, but that, you know, we've allowed the terms to be set by tech companies, really, about what our kids should be learning or what workforce readiness means or what are the skills that they need to be developing in K through 12 education. And I just reject that. I reject it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and trust me, I am a very practical person. I am not someone who's like, ooh, I don't care what my kids do. Like, if they don't, you know, can't support, like, no. My girls need to support themselves. <laughs> they need to get jobs like, don't. <laughs> with salaries. <laughs> like, if they, whatever they want to do, they need to, you know. A 401k. Life is yeah, real. <laughs> it's not going to be funded by us for the rest of their lives. So, like, <laughs> I'm not saying I don't care about workforce readiness. I do. I just think that it is, frankly, bullshit that this is the way to go about it. Yep. Let me affirm that with a recent experience (laughs) in my community. So our school district went through a a big community-wide process of asking, what is the promise of our school district? Hmm. If you graduate here... What is the expectation? We called it portrait of a graduate. It was a million meetings and a lot of time and a lot Mm -hmm. of people. But it was really valuable, I thought, as a parent participating in it. Because we sat at tables with educators, with business leaders, Mm -hmm. with families, with students, and talked about what should you come out of this K-12 experience with. Not a single business leader mentioned anything that would not fall under the umbrella of soft skills. Mm. It was all about being able to have a conversation, being able to introduce yourself, being able to tolerate different perspectives from yours, being Cold able calls. to vigorously <laughs> argue a point mm-hmm. and then kind of back away from it when things go in a different direction and stay on board the team. It was all soft skills. Nobody was in there saying, we really need more coders. <laughs> Everybody said from the business side, We can teach them what they need to know to do the job. 
Right. We cannot make them the kind of person that we want to work here. Mm. And that's the baseline that we need to be developing. So can I just tell a story about something my older daughter did that I'm like, I am so proud of her. And it has nothing to do with any kind of technology. So she lost her That's purse. connection. That's There's a reason for that. <laughs> but go ahead. She lost her purse. She was distraught. She was so upset. She was so, she's like a real perfectionist. So like anything that she feels like she has done wrong, she just will like beat herself up over. Um, She had like all her special little trinkets in her purse. You know, she's in sixth grade. So it's like, she doesn't have like, she doesn't have phone. There's something like serious in the purse. There was no credit cards, obviously. (laughs) Um, She was pretty sure that she left at the deli, that she, she walks to and from school, that she and her friend had gone to after school that day. She went back to that deli by herself multiple times. And she talked to the person behind the counter. The person behind the counter called their manager. She talked to the manager on the phone. She got that purse back. Yes. Herself. God, I was hoping that that was the ending. She like navigated the situation. And like, I feel like I am really proud of her for doing that. And that that is the kind of thing that I think is one of the most important skills that she could be learning in middle school is how to like, how to talk to people, how to navigate sort of slightly complicated, you know, social situations with strangers. Like it was awesome. Yeah. And she did it all herself. We were not involved at all. I mean, I've said cold call only half jokingly. I really feel like if I can teach my kids to leave my home and they can cold call, there's not much they can't do. You know what I mean? Like if you can ask an adult for something as a, you know, 12 year old, 15 year old, 18 year old kid without having to be coached through every section of it, like you're yep. good. You could probably make it. You can piece things together from there. Exactly. I'm just glad she got the purse back. I know, me too. She was so happy. <laughs> and I don't think you can acquire that kind of confidence through technology. No. I just don't. My third grader is really excited right now. She's making a website about sinkholes and she is fascinated by sinkholes oh. and she is in love with her website. And she has carefully selected pictures and written copy. And I think it's great. Oh, I love that. I don't because I think sinkholes are terrifying, but I'm excited for Ellen. <laughs> they are terrifying. So I don't scary. know how she sleeps at night now, but she's really into it. I think that's great. And a super appropriate use of technology. Developing skills in her that she will use in her life for sure. Yep. This is the same kid, though, who when I recently invited her to come onto the podcast with me and ask her what she'd like to talk about, she said, stress. Mm. And it was all about the number of units in her online math and reading programs that she has to do every week. Mm. And the pain point of the stress for her, I promise I'm going somewhere with this, is that she needs to get those done on Thursday. Because if she gets them done on Thursday for the week, then on Friday, she gets free time on her computer to play games. The rest is also on the screen for her. And I'm not mad at her teacher. Her teacher's great. I'm not mad at her school. Her school's excellent. But I saw during spring break this kind of coming to fruition because when she got tired of playing at the pool or the ocean, she wanted to come back in and have free time on her iPad, right? Like that she's learning that the rest is on the screen too. Mm. It's the source of stress and it is the, the relief Mm. And man, that's the t- the thing I'm trying to escape all the time as an adult. Don't scroll your phone, Beth. You're tired. Yeah. You don't don't think Instagram has the solution for you, right? But she's dealing with that in third grade too. That's because mm. we put the TV on the phone, y'all. I'm telling you, it's a problem. TV is now on the screen. That's where we watch TV. Oh, don't get me. Started. Oh no, I mean, I I that is what I am very strict about internet use, but like. I am not super strict about TV. Yeah. So TV was my my sibling. I was an only child. (laughs) TV was my other sibling. The only sibling I ever had. My children are like, they're elderly. They have like elderly tastes, which I I don't mind. We we did a whole Gilmore Girls watch. We watched the whole series and now we're starting it over. Love it. What else? They really love 30 Rock, which I'm like, (laughs) I'm not mad about it. But I'm just always joke with my my older daughter, especially is a very old soul. And I joke with her. I'm like, what Gen Xer died and was reincarnated as you? Because all of her tastes, like she likes to listen to music with my parents. Like they're listening to like Carol King. Yes. Listen, me and my 14 year old are rewatching The Sopranos. Follow me for more parenting advice. Okay. Like <laughs> this is, but I th- I really do think there's something tied up in the, like, I don't think there's bad, is anything bad to watch TV to relax. 
Yeah. But now the I TV. Mean, I love TV. I mean, so TikTok is just TV. That's all it is. We're not interacting. It's TV. We're watching things. We're just watching, 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 watching. And so now we've like put watching in so many places. So there's so much watching. But we're going watching on. things that do not have a beginning and a middle. Yes. And, an end, and we're watching them alone mm-hmm. instead of together and talking about them. Well, Jessica, I really appreciate your research in this area yes. and you continuing to dig into the things that are things in my life that I feel like I don't always have an outlet for. So uh, it's very helpful to me. And I hope you'll continue to come back occasionally and tell us what you're working on. Oh, no. Thank you so much for having me. And it's just like fun to vent. Yes. I I'm always like, I, I want to be more profane. But <laughs> as I'm always told is, uh, this is a family newspaper. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I just get very passionate uh, about these things. And so so I appreciate that I can come. Listen, I love the New York Times. I get the Sunday New York Times mailed to my house in Paducah, Kentucky. Nice. Love a print subscriber. I love a, listen, I love it. But Jessica, there's not a lot of times in the New York Times where uh, the things are, like she's like best at the beginning, anticipating things happening here in conversations yeah. here in Middle Cold America. I'm not saying that that's like a often experience. So the fact that you have you have accomplished that, where we feel like we're over here in, in Kentucky, and you're capturing our conversations across the country is a real testament to your work. Oh, thank you. That really honestly means the world because that's that's always what I'm trying to do is talk about things that are complicated and national mm. and, and summarize them in a way that makes people feel like what they're experiencing is reflected. So honestly, like really made my day. Thank you so much. You do a great job. Thank you. I know, Sarah, that you are always in pursuit of a better mousetrap. Yes. Yes. Not to sell to other people, but in terms of processes to institute in your own life. Yes. We both have children, which means we have cups everywhere. Mm -hmm. And let me confess, too, many people know, I like to have multiple beverages available in the course of a day. So I, too, can create a graveyard of cups in my wake. And you have developed a solution in your house that is working for you. Why don't you tell us about it? It is working. And I have tried so many things. I remember when they were little, I saw on Pinterest where somebody had taken light plastic cups and hot glued magnets. So they just stuck on the fridge. (laughs) So you could just, they could just pull the cup off the fridge and put it in the water dispenser and then good. And then just stick it right back on the fridge. And because I don't do other drinks, should say that for my children, they drink water. That is their available beverage. Obviously not baby diabetic. He has to have juice boxes. But before that, before Felix was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, like there was no juices, anything, because I don't want to clean up those messes. If somebody spills a water, that's just a little extra cleanup. If somebody spills a milk or a juice, like forget it. No. Or a soda. God save us. Like, no. That's a big old mess. So I believe in like the water dispenser. You can get it yourself. Whatever. Okay. So I, I feel like the water dispenser on the outside of the fridge Solves a lot of problems. And if you just tell them that's the only beverage available, your kids don't drink anything else but water, do they? They occasionally will have a Sprite Zero. uh, Mm -hmm. And then with breakfast, they will sometimes have orange juice. We don't drink anything other than water outside the kitchen. There you go. There you go. Okay. So that makes sense. Okay. So that's the baseline we're, we're working with here. But then there were still cups. And I can't, I just, Beth, I can't do it. First of all, I have designed my kitchen to have very little counter space on purpose because I think counter space is the source of all suffering inside the American home. Personally, that's that's the decision I've come to, okay? It just collects bullshit. That's all countertop does. That's this like whole job in life. Would you like me to hold some bullshit for you? I would be happy to. And so I designed my kitchen. I took out countertop. And so there's like a, there's a small space. So you have to clean it in order to cook, which Nicholas does. So I can't have the cups. I can't have the cups on the countertop. I don't want to do it. I don't. And I'm the one who picks them up. And it fills me with rage and resentment. Do you understand what I'm saying? I completely do. I'm a little distracted because I love counter space because I Mm -mm. cook, I entertain often. We do too. I'm telling you, you don't need as much as you think you do, people. I frequently have my entire counter space covered with hot pans from the oven. So I really struggle with eliminating counter space 
when I feel that I would always like to have more. But I get your point that surfaces collect things. It is hard to have a surface that doesn't collect. And it is hard to convince people that the kitchen is not the family landing spot for things. That's tricky. Because it is. That's the problem. It is. the Like, I had a run of countertop right as my garage door, right as you entered before I redid my kitchen. Can you imagine? Can you just think, like, all the things— Mail, school things, books, packages. No. And this, like the compact space, which like we've hosted, listen, we've hosted Thanksgiving for my entire extended family. And look, every bit of counter space was taken, legit, for sure. But it just forces you to clean as you go. Like it's a little bit more work when you're hosting, no doubt about it. You have to be very intentional. Like this has to get cleaned up, this has to get put away. Yeah, which I we do. Have a, I, I'm a clean as you yeah, go person. I you gotta do that it. That's the way. Yep. And we definitely have a a run of counter inside my laundry room, and we call it the messy kitchen. And we just like it's a, a little little cabinet, but we just stick stuff in there during parties. <laughs> just go there. Um, but like in the everyday, if you come in and you drop something on the island, like you know schoolwork or whatever, and my kids do schoolwork in our kitchen, you got to pick it up if Nicholas is going to cook. Like it just has to get put away. And so I like that. I like that forcefulness. Like you have to do it. It has to get cleaned up. Okay. So the cups were messing with that is what I'm saying. And so I tried a couple things. First, I tried everybody having their own water bottle. Obviously, we've done that. Do you guys have your own water bottles? Oh, yeah. We all have multiple water bottles. That won't work. We have a lot of water bottles here. But yes, for the most part, we each gravitate toward one regular, this is my water bottle. Right. So we all have a water bottle. I tried that. But then guess what I'm picking up? The freaking water bottles. Yeah. Then the water bottles are just over. That's not solving the problem. I do not enjoy that either. This was the breakthrough moment. And I did this with the water bottles for a while, and then I've, I've gone through one more evolution. I started picking up the water bottles, refilling them, and putting them in the fridge. Okay. So we have a drawer right inside the door, almost like where you keep the milk, but we don't drink milk. So that's the water bottle drawer. Do you keep milk for cereal and things? Like, you all don't do cereal? Just there's no, no milk no in your life? Here. No. Okay. Mm-hmm. No milk. We have almond milk. Does that count? I mean, it does. We have almond milk and regular milk always. So I'm just picturing what I would do with that space if milk were not a part of my day. Yeah. I mean, a gallon of milk takes up so much freaking room. Okay. So this is hilariously, the other thing that that is held in this drawer shelf is hot sauce. That's what we have a lot of in our fridge is a lot of hot sauce. So the water bottles go in the drawer. And it was just something about like they had a place that wasn't like where they were kept to be cleaned because... That didn't really work either because also I don't think water bottles need to be cleaned that much. Now, you have to watch because sometimes you'll take them apart and you're like, oh, my God. But so we put them in the fridge. That really helped. It helped me because I like my water cold and my worthless fridge, which I hate, and I will replace when it breaks, obviously, but I'm not going to replace it before it breaks. The water line is not refrigerated, so the water comes out like room temp. It's awful. Anyway, and so putting them in the fridge, that seemed to really click everything into place. Are you using insulated water bottles? Yes. Yes. But then, see, here's the next evolution. Then we ditched the water bottles because here's what was happening to me with the water bottles. They were getting taken to school, which is fine. So now we've moved to, like, a cheap Stanley situation because, obviously, I didn't buy Stanleys for all my children because I don't want to sell a kidney. But now we have these, like, water glasses with straws That seemed to really, that seems to be the final evolution that I was looking for. Because they don't really take those out of the house. You know what I mean? Like, they're not, they don't feel like a thing you would, like, stick in the car and take somewhere with a straw. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so they stay. And they stay real. Now, I still sometimes have to fight Griffin because he'll take them up to his room. And he'll be like, it's upstairs. And he'll get a glass. And I'm like, do you love me, child? Do you love me at all? And he's like, I love you, mom, whatever. So that seems to be that I think I've done it. So now, even if the, even if the three glasses they have are around, it doesn't bother me as much because I know exactly what to do with them. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I'm not putting them in the dishwasher, and then I got a dishwasher full of glasses that got used three times. Three times, maybe. Let's be honest. And then maybe probably just three drinks is a probably more accurate description. But I have the water bottles. That's Felix's job at the end of dinner to fill the water glasses back up and put them in their fridge. They're there. I know where they go, and I don't feel like they're having to be circulated every time. Does that make sense? It does. It also bothers me enormously in this respect. I'm kind of moody about my beverage vessel. (laughs) You know how you are about mugs? But listen, I do what I want. This is for the children. Do you see what I'm saying? I do, but I also respect their moodiness about their drink vessels. For example, 
Jane is very attracted to the cups that Chad brought home from the Masters. Okay. And I understand why. They're interesting cups. We don't have anything like them here. And so in the mornings now, she wants to have her water in the Masters cup. She also will take three sips and be done. And there'll be an entire glass of water just sitting on the See? counter. See? But I'm trying to use this as a teaching moment because I have said to her, now we know that dad does not want these cups in the dishwasher. And oh, Lord. I will personally not be hand washing your water glass every morning. So what I'm going to need you to do as soon as you're finished is go ahead and wash that up and dry it and put it away. And I think opportunities for her to meet the sink and the dawn and the, the scrub brush are good ones because she does not like to help clean up. I think opportunities to say, you're going to go up to your room now and collect all the cups and load the dishwasher and then you'll be unloading it. Those are good moments for me. So that's my tension about it. I haven't unloaded my dishwasher in years. I don't do that. That's what I had children for. Are you ready for this? I'm about to I'm about to really blow your mind. This morning, a child, Amos or Griffin, not sure which, did use a plastic cup, clearly put ice water and took three drinks. You know what I did? Dumped it out, put it right in the drawer. Okay. Did it. Okay. Did it. Don't even care. Because honestly, <laughs> honestly, this is we're talking about a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old boy. It's going to dry off. Like, I'm probably going to have some, like, biologist email me and say, that's disgusting. And perhaps it is. But it's like, they're all up in each other's business anyway. Do we think there are some germs that they don't already share? Do we think there's just some, you know, microbe, monstrous situation happening on the rim of a cup that they took three sips out of? I mean, I kind of rinse it off a little bit. But no, I'm not doing the Dawn and the all thing because you took three drinks. I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not doing it. We're family. We share germs. And I can't believe I just submitted that on the internet, but it is true. I'm going to just need some time with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to need some time with it. Uh, I am obsessive about things being clean in my kitchen, uh, like to a point that is probably unhealthy. I wash my hands constantly. Like I am, I'm brutal in that space. But again, like our conversation about throw pillows, I make no apologies for that. It is a space in which I am operating in my preferences control, and that is fine. Well, I'm hardcore about food safety. I mean, the truth is, that's why I don't cook. There's just, I cannot make myself comfortable with raw chicken. I cannot do it. I cannot, I cannot lose it's the anxi anxiety about raw chicken or raw pork. That's why, I, and Nicholas is hardcore. I mean, like, you come to, he's going to be like, you do what with those glasses? <laughs> but it's like, to me, it's like, this is not a foodborne pathogen. This is like freaking Amos taking three drinks from a cup. I'm going to rinse it off. I'm going to put it back. I'm just saying. I'm always going to use the Dawn. I'm just, I, I just am. I go through a lot of Dawn here. <laughs> and let me add one more qualifier to the putting it back in the drawer. The drawer I'm putting it back in is cups that only my children use. This is not going back into the shelf that ever the glasses like I would serve to company. I do want to clarify this. This is like the plastic cup drawer from which they pull to fill a glass, drink three things, and then never touch it again. Just does that help anything? I mean, no, but yes, I see your point. <laughs> I see how for a normal person that, that would help things. <laughs> Here is what I am really struggling with right now. It is the school water bottle. Because I, too, observe that my water bottle stays relatively clean. So I rinse it when I refill yeah. it, but I am not scrubbing yep. it every time. The school water bottle, however is never clean oh, under any circumstances. It's almost no. like the second I put a drop of water in it, it attracts all of the world's dust and pencil shavings and God knows what else. And so Ellen has made this even more complicated. The schools here ask us to send in clear water bottles because people are bringing not water and yeah. spilling it and it's gross, right? So the clear water bottle is enforcing some compliance, which I totally respect and get. So I get the clear water bottle. It's been a great water bottle. It was very cheap. I got it on Amazon. It's the first water bottle we've ever given her that's lasted all year. Oh, wow. She hasn't lost it somewhere, left it somewhere, broken it. It's amazing. She has, however, covered it in Taylor Swift stickers. <laughs> I also respect this. I am not here to dull her sparkle. But for the longest time, I told myself that the dark spots I was seeing inside the water bottle were the sticker residues. And it's confusing now to clean it and know that it's clean because there is some sticker residue, but there is also some filth. And so I'm really working on how frequently 
Do we need to full on put that guy through the dishwasher for it to actually be clean? Ellen seems not to care about this. I can take a paper towel to the inside of the top of this thing and pull it out and show her what looks like soil all over the paper (laughs) towel. And she's like, "Mm." you know, so she's not disturbed by this, but I really am. Yeah, I mean, my kids went through phases where they had water bottles, but nobody carries a water bottle to school anymore. I don't know why. Felix really should because of his diabetes, but he doesn't. So they just drink out of the... It might be a boy thing. They can't keep up with it anyway, so they just gave up. I don't know. You know, I think where I am on that sort of, like, black stuff you find inside water bottles, the pieces of it, is, like, it's so gross. But I really... I. I'm just going to be honest. Obviously, this is probably already abundantly clear by what I just said about the water glasses. I watch these Instagrams where people are like going to hotels and re-cleaning the bathrooms where people are like cleaning everything all the time. And I think, guys, this is bad for us. You, ha- Your body has to work on something or it starts working on itself. And so, like, clearly this black sludge that's probably in half the water bottles in America is not harm. We're not all vomiting our faces off. Like, it's clearly not that harmful. She's not sick all the time. She's not having some gastrointestinal distress. It's, I mean, again, maybe I'll get a a biologist who's like, no, this is what it, but even like that, did you see the one that went away around about Arby's ice machines and how gross they are? And he, like, grew something from the cup he got. I'm like, just stop. Yes, we're all exposed to nastiness all the time. It's okay. Our bodies are meant to fight that stuff. I think all the time about the guy who freaking cured his colitis by walking through the belly of Africa and getting a tapeworm because then his body just had to pay attention to the tapeworm and stop beating itself up. This was like an NPR story. Please don't ask for a link. I heard it like 10 decades ago, but it's just never left me. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, I just think like it has to have something. You have to have some dirt in your life. I totally agree with that. I am not recleaning anything in the hotel. Have you seen these? I have. Have you yes. seen these? I have. Post COVID, I'm not wiping down the airplane area. I feel dumb that no. I did during COVID. Now that we know what we know about how it transmitted, so I'm I'm mostly pretty cool. I can remind myself we used to live outside. You know, right. it's relatively new that we can wash our hands easily at all. <laughs> so I try to remind myself of these things, but but then when I see the water bottle, I think, you know, in this little sphere of the the vast chaotic universe, I do have control over this and I don't want this for myself. I would just push it through the end of school year and then be like, we need a new bottle for the summer. Just get, I mean, you're, you can see it. We can spit on the last day of school. It's like right there. Yeah. And it's fine. The water bottle's in great shape. It just gets really yeah. dirty at school. It just, I, yeah. I don't know if she leaves the lid open, you know, when she's not drinking out of it, but I, I don't know what's going in there, but it is gross in there. I bet that is the least problematic germ she's exposed to. I'm certain it is. School. <laughs> I'm certain it is. So cups, obviously, are really just a vessel for us t- to talk about germs, too, clearly. Organization, germs, control, teachable yeah. moments, a lot wrapped up in the cups. So we're interested. Yep. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of cup feedback. We welcome it. I hope I'm not the only one that just rinses the cup bag and puts it in the I'm door. I'm positive that gonna... you aren't. I feel like I won't be. You will not like be. You, all, all of my people out there who just rinse it off a little bit and throw it back in the door, hit me up. I can't wait to hear from you. You will in droves. The lesson of making this show for me is that in all things, we are never alone. True. In all of them. So thank True. you for being here and for reinforcing that message to us always. Thank you to Jessica Gross for joining us. We really hope this episode was helpful to you. We would love for you to share it with the people in your lives who are also thinking about their children's technology consumption or their children's mental health or relationships with other people. Cup usage. Cup usage. Whatever. <laughs> this would be a great episode to listen to with a, a young adult and get their thoughts on it. So thank you for sharing it with your people. And please don't forget to join us on our premium channels where we are continuing to discuss democracy in America. We'll see you there and we'll see you back here next week. Have the best weekend available to you. Pantsu Politics is produced by Studio D Podcast Production. Elise Knapp is our Managing Director. Maggie Pinton is our Director of Community Engagement. Xander Singh is the composer of our theme music with inspiration from original work by Dante Lima. 
Our show is listener supported. Special thanks to our executive producers. Martha Brunitsky. Allie Edwards. Janice Elliott. Sarah Greenup. Julie Haller. Tiffany Hassler. Emily Holliday. Katie Johnson. Katina Zuganellis kasling Barry Kaufman. Catherine Vollmer. Lori Ladeau. Lily McClure. Linda Daniel. The Hessians! Tracy Putoff. Sarah Ralph. Jeremy Sequoia. Katie Steigers. Karen True. Annika Uveline. Nick and Elisa Valelli. Amy Whited. Emily Helen Olson. Lee Shea McDonough. Morgan McHugh. Jen Ross. Sabrina Drago. Becca Dorval. Christina Cordararo. Shannon Frawley. Jessica Whitehead. Samantha Chalmers. Crystal Kemp. Megan Hart. The Lima Family! <laughs> the Adair Family. Jeff Davis, Melinda Johnston, Michelle Wood, Nicole Berkless, Paula Bremer, and Tim Miller.